We'll now return to open session for the regular meeting of the Lompoc City Council for Tuesday, November 5th, 2019. <coughs> Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Council Member Mosby. Present. Council Member Vega. Here. Council Member Cordova. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Dirk Starbuck. Present. Mayor Janelle Osborne. Here. City Attorney, report from closed session, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session tonight to discuss the three items on the agenda, but actually only discussed two of them. Uh, item number two, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation in the Canagizer case. Council did not discuss that matter. Uh, but the other two items, uh, council had a discussion with staff, but no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll have a presentation by the Lompoc District Library Foundation to the Lompoc Public Library. Please come forward to the podium. Hi, good evening, council members and the Lompoc community. My name is Melinda, and I am with the Lompoc District Libraries Foundation, and some of the board members are here tonight, and I have Arlene Lewis and Robin Small. I have three items to cover tonight, and I wanted to um, share with everybody one of our most lucrative uh, fundraisers that we have is a... Um, is our quarterly newsletter. So, and it's attached with it, we send it out to the community of Lompoc. Attached to it is also a, um, an envelope for donations. And guess what? I've got some for you guys. <laughs> so, um, number two is the Library Foundation is having a chamber mixer. And I did leave some invites out there. So it would be nice if the council members would join us that night. It will be at the Lompoc Library in the Grossman Gallery at 530. And it is free. And the date? The date. Oh, sorry. November 14th. Thank you. <laughs> and I think I included a flyer in there. Thank, Thank you. you. And the last one is... The mortgage note, so everybody knows that the foundation was held a mortgage note. It was sold and distributed to the city per the 2013 MOU or Memorandum of Understanding signed by the city, the Benton Trust, and the Friends of the Library and the Library Foundation. Tonight, the Library Foundation would like to present Sarah, the librarian, a check for $192,000. $363,000 for the operation and maintenance of the bookmobile. Would anybody? Yes. Um, I want to thank the foundation and everyone in the community who has been very supportive of the bookmobile. Um, the bookmobile was not originally supposed to be a bookmobile. Um, Charlotte Benton had left her um, estate to the city to turn her house into a library, a children's library, and it just wasn't possible. And in 2015, we were able to get a bookmobile, and now we are able to take the library services to children all over the community. Um, one of the great things that we've been able to do with that is go to places like um, the Bridge House, the homeless shelter, where those children would never actually be able to make it into the library or to where Charlotte Benton's old house was on I and Cyprus. So the bookmobile comes to them and gives them a little sense of normality while they're experiencing homelessness with their families. Um, we've had great success in all areas of the community. Um, and you, the community supports us really well when they come to uh, public events, like when we're at Old Town Market. And uh, we go to all the schools, and the kids know when they see the bookmobile that it is the library. And I know that Charlotte Benton would love that everybody still talks about her and remembers her and appreciates what she's done for the children of Lompoc. So thank you very much. Robin, Robin or Arlene, would you guys like to say anything? No? Okay, good. Okay. okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you to the foundation for working so hard to make Charlotte's dream a reality, even though it's a modern version of that. So thank you all for doing that. 
Um, City Manager, report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. A um, couple reminders tonight. We have a reminder for the public. We're going to be having our special, another special meeting this Thursday, November 7th, 6.30 p.m. here in the chamber, and we'll be discussing the zoning code update. Another reminder is that city offices will be closed this coming Monday, November 11th, in observance of Veterans Day. We also have one, it's the annual Toys for Tots Flying, which will be held at the city airport on December 7th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The National Toys for Tot campaign was founded in 1947 with the sole purpose to support local family assistance organizations with toy boxes for distribution and collection sites. The goal is to help those less fortunate so those families can enjoy the holidays without fear of not having a toy for a, toy for a child and any toy, toy any toy donations can be made at the airport that day. Um, lastly, I do want to give a special thanks to all the volunteers that did show up for the annual Make a Difference Day. We had a record turnout this year. We had, final count was 312 volunteers working at 12 different locations around the town. That was the best turnout ever we've ever had. Um, we would never have been as successful either as uh, for the turnout if it hadn't been for our City's new office assistant, uh, Tara Nessler. She's tirelessly worked with the park supervisor to help put together our greatest event showing to date. So I want to thank everybody for doing that. And if we can beat that record next year, that would be even better. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the consent calendar. Consent calendar is considered to be routine and enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to council vote. Any items withdrawn from consent calendar for separate discussion will be addressed immediately before the second oral communication near the end of the meeting. We will now open the floor for public comment on the consent calendar. Seeing no one rise, we'll close public comment on consent calendar and I will entertain a motion. Councilmember Cordova. I move to accept the consent calendar. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. There are no staff presentations, announcements, or requests on the agenda, so we will move to oral communications regarding city matters. Whether it's on the agenda or not, um, it's preferable that you wait to comment on an item on the agenda, but until that, please come forward for oral communications on city matters. Deb Andrews, Mission Hills. I would urge the city council to consider opening the meeting with prayer, have an invocation like we have had in the past. I think it's very meaningful, and I'd like to see that brought back. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Hello, my name is Maria Genega. Today I'm speaking as a Lompoc community member about a forum I attended as a Lompoc community member. The reason I make that clarification is that I also serve as Councilman Jim Mosby's Public Safety Commissioner. On Monday, I attended with other Lompoc community members a forum sponsored by the Community Action Commission of Santa Barbara County. The 2018-2019 Youth Needs Assessment, headed by Dr. Jill Sharkey of UCSB, was presented at the forum. The assessment will be incorporated into the 2020-2024 Strategic Work Plan of the South Coast Youth Safety Partnership. The goal of the partnership is mobilizing and engaging communities to help reduce violence and keep our youth safe. The partnership was formed in response to an increase of gang violence in the South Coast. My hope is that all members of the Lompoc City Council will read this document and be open to discussion on the subject matter in the near future. I only brought one, so if maybe um, Lompoc can make copies for all of you, that would be great. It does have statistics on Lompoc youth, and they don't look good. So I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. 
Madam Mayor, Council Members, thank you. My name is Jerome White. I live at 423 North F Street. I uh, lived in Lompoc uh, since 2013. Uh, first in an apartment, later I actually bought a house on L Street, and I now live on F Street. I have three topics to bring to your attention. First of all, I'm concerned about the speeding on our streets. Now, I appreciate that the police department's doing all they could. I had a good discussion today with Sergeant Morgan. I understand that there's a, some grant funding available to address some of these issues. And I appreciate that uh, there will be continued funding for that. When my wife backs out onto F Street, I don't want to have some guy coming down the street at 40 miles an hour, because I guarantee you, he will not be able to stop in time. The second issue, as soon as funding can be found, I really want you guys to consider zoning enforcement. I've given you a display of a couple of derelict vehicles. That's nothing new that you don't know about. Uh, the other issue, of course, is besides cars with flat tires and uh, the, the, the sense that Lompoc uh, is this kind of um, trashy place. Well, it's not. I, I believe strongly in this town, and I think that the, there are things that this town, this city council can do to make it better. The last item, also on those photographs, are two vehicles, two RVs, that are parked on the same block as I live. Now, I understand that those guys have to park somewhere. I understand there's something called a safe parking program. I strongly urge your uh, your, your, uh, your council to reconsider locations that will work for these people. I spoke with one of them, and uh, I have a sincere belief that all they want is a reasonable place to park their RV. I don't particularly enjoy seeing them out on the street, uh, barbecuing and cooking where they can on the sidewalk. I think they could do better than that, and I think the city council could do better than that. There was discussion uh, I, I applaud uh, Mayor Osborne and some of you who realize that there is a need for a bare bones program somewhere in this town. And I, I understand the concern that some property owners might have that it wouldn't be appropriate in some areas. But I think uh, that there's an opportunity here for the city council to redirect their influence in establishing areas where these people can park their RVs and not have to pay $30 a night Lastly, I realize that the seriousness of budgets with you guys, uh, just we all struggle to make ends meet and I, we all appreciate what you're doing. But as my mom said, don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Thank you. Good evening, my name's John Schluter. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, First thing, I'm really glad about the library. That book with me makes a big difference. Education gives us strength and gives education to stop some of the problems we're having right now. When I was here last time, I talked about alternative measures, about cameras, et cetera, that can be used to help spotlight some of the areas that are really bad. Where I live, there's like a constant gang problem. I'm very proud to say the police had someone up against a deal over there. I don't know why, they found a few stolen cars, so progress is being made. But one of my concerns is when we were here last time, you said you're gonna have a get together where people could come and like voice their concerns. And I got stopped on the street. Apparently this thing's listened to, and I got stopped on the streets and there's some LA people who wanted to get in Guardian Angel. I said, I don't think you're quite up for Guardian Angel. But they wanna help, they wanna make a difference. They wanna get a chance to get involved and voice their concerns and make it so people know what's going on. Education's power. These people use fear to do it. If we use love and education, we will reach the people we need to reach. People are starting to get upset about the problems that are going on around here. That young man who changed his life, fought the games, got out, came back and got killed after he did all that stuff to do that is an example. Others need to follow. We need to make sure we can reach those kids with love and not try to punish them. Maybe we need to teach them how to do something, teach them a vocation, because it's a lot cheaper to teach someone than it is to like, put them in jail or prison. It's a lot cheaper. It costs, what, $100,000 to $200,000 a year to put someone in prison? It would be cheaper just to pay them a job and get something good out of it, make them a responsible human being and see what it's like to be part of the problem and the solution instead of the problem. They don't believe it can be done. 
but I know from experience working with people that you can reach them. And when you get public willing to help, we need to make them know where we can come help. I know people want to volunteer right now to help, and all they need to know is just where to call and who to get in touch with. And I think by doing that, we get more and more people involved. Look how many people here. There's people that are scared. They shouldn't be afraid in Lompoc. We were the flower capital of the world. And this place is worth saving. So thank you for your listening, and uh, have a good holiday. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Steve Bridge. I'm a resident of Lompoc. You guys kind of know me, I think. Over the last year, we've been discussing public safety and the resources required to meet the city's needs. This has been exasperated by increase in the number of violent crimes and the pressure of growth on, and homelessness. We've had a few meetings to discuss ways to improve this, which have ranged from more money to neighborhood support groups to more activities with our youth. My belief, based on years of running service companies, is that the real issue is a shortage shortage of resources. We simply have too many vacancies in our police and fire departments. In the past, in private industry, which is where I kind of spent my time, you wouldn't just throw money at it. You'd, you'd find a way to create perks that had back-end incentives, they call them golden handcuffs and things of that nature, like stock options, ghost stock, deferred compensation, other means. Obviously, we're in the public sector. We can't do that. In thinking how we could apply this to our present problem, I come up with the following suggestion. Let's create a home ownership partnership with our public safety workforce. I'm suggesting that up to $50,000 be offered for down payment on the house within Lompoc and that be made available to our public uh, force. It could be structured that it was paid back upon the sale of property or after 10 years, it convert to a low interest loan. It would be mandatory that the house be lived in by the officers and be in the city. Um, it would automatically convert to a market rate loan in 10 years or if the officer left or you know some parameter such as that. Um, this would be a strong incentive to recruiting especially young people starting a family, the opportunity to have a house. It put officers in our city because they'd have to live in our city. Um, there is obviously a question of funding, but if you take the 10 vacancies and, I don't know, 100,000 a year, and you multiply that by six months that we've had those vacancies, there's funding available. So I've provided a synopsis that outline this concept. My recommendation is that the City Council direct the Public Safety Commission and the staff to review this and approve it. I'm sure it can be made better and come back with perhaps an implementation plan. In closing, what I would say about this is that I'm sure there's going to be many who are going to say this can't be done. But if Lompoc wants to move forward as a successful city, we have to find ways to stop saying we can't do things and find ways to say yes to proactive measures. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, council members. Matthew Barron with the Guardian Angels. I want to say we had a great event on Saturday. The Lompoc, we, we joined with all the rest of the volunteers for the Lompoc Make a Difference Day, and it was uh, a great day. The, the city staff were fabulous. They even, they even made time earlier for me to come in and talk with them about what it is we'd like to do, if, if anything specific, and then they went to work, and, and I mean went to work. And uh, Christina Ramirez would, uh, guided us and, and shadowed us and helped us, uh, all the members, uh, do the work over at the college, uh, the Arbor Apartments. So uh, I'm very happy about that. And uh, thank you. Thank you to the city for making that opportunity available. Also, I want to express concern about um, some areas in Lompoc that, uh, you know, and I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed because of my lack of involvement until 
just very recently, I was completely unaware of the state of some of our low-income housing areas. Arbor Apartments, where Eric Villa was, was murdered, uh, D and E Alley. Oh, if you have never driven over by the D and E Alley, do yourself a favor, because it's a reality check. And what it is, I believe, in some way, is evidence that these people that, whoever they are, corporations, I'm sure, hidden inside corporations, buying up housing to rent to low-income people, and then letting that housing go to hell, literally, hell, Bring, allowing tenants to come in that have criminal records. Now, I know there's laws that you, you have parameters, but come on. This is ridiculous, and it's a breeding ground for all the problems that we have. Now, I wouldn't know this unless somebody shared this with me or said, hey, did you, have you ever seen this? I wouldn't have known. So I don't expect that you, I expect that you may not even know. You may not even know. Deanie Alley, Arbor Apartments, over by, uh, out behind uh, the box shop on G and uh, Airport. Ch check those areas out. It's sad, it's really sad, and it's evidence that somebody's not holding these people and or these corporations to account. And they need to be held to account. So I put that forward to, to the council for, for your consideration. Thank you. And, and again, thank you for the wonderful Make a Difference there. It was fabulous. Thank you. Seeing, oh. Hello. Um, I want my two seconds at the end. You started early. I'm Augustine Arias, I'm a member of the Lompoc Police Officer Association, and I'm also a sergeant at the police department, who I'm here to defend myself. Last time I was here, I was working on homicide, the one you mentioned earlier, the one we solved. And I got grandstanded a little bit and called by name, called by rank. I'm on duty, I can't come talk in public, so I'm off duty right now. And the reason why I smirked is because you're misleading the public. You said that we gave these guys 9%. You did, nine years ago, or three years ago. So what's it equate out to be? Cost of living in the, in the United States is like 2.7 a year. They gave us 0.3 more. A great, I'm grateful, I'm happy. That was good, thanks. We gave you three positions, yet you froze our budget and didn't let us hire, and then we lost six officers. So let's not kid the public and let's tell the whole story. That's why we're in the position we're in now. So... That's where the disconnect is. I, later that week, I attended a public safety meeting and saw a very good outcome, a lot of support, and I appreciate it. I appreciate the camera talk. That's a great thing. Once again, that's a reactive tool that'll help us solve crimes. It's not gonna help us prevent crimes. Um, and the, the, what I did notice is the unfortunate part is that instead of grasping your police department and doing what we can to work together, you cast a shadow that we're the bad people here. And the people running your public safety commission that you guys elected come up, oh, shit's gonna change. Those were exact terms used to me by one of the commissioner's husbands. Like, it doesn't have to change. You think we don't want cameras up to help us solve crime? But yet, you cast that, that the police department's here to be adversarial, not at all. We got a tax to pass. You've been in office now, you really haven't done anything to support public safety. Realistically, you froze us. We're down now probably, what, 10 positions, 12 positions. You haven't built any new homes. Other than marijuana, you haven't brought any real business to town. A couple stores, that's cool. That'll help out. A couple restaurants that, that just takes money from other restaurants. Um, so I, you know, pretty much here to defend myself. I'm pretty transparent. I'm not here to lie to nobody. Anybody has questions about the state of the police department, come ask the police department. No, no, nobody's going to give it to you straight. And it's, it's not necessarily of, a, of an election or people elected you. It's an oath. I've stayed in this, in this city because I was raised here. So the only reason I stayed here is to help out. I could go somewhere else and make more money and not even talk about my money. 
I'm talking about the young police officers that I'm trying to keep here. I'm try talking about things like that. And you know what? You could do a lot more to be supportive and have independent decisions. I understand there's landlord-tenant problems here or something. If we disagree, there's got to be something mor with that morality of, like, you guys are in business together outside of being on the council. There should be rules against that. But, hey, please do me a favor. Make independent decisions for yourself. Let's work together. Let's fix this. Whatever it takes. So enough is enough. I'm, I'm done. You grandstanded me. I didn't appreciate it. I'm letting you know I didn't appreciate it, and my time's up. But I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help you guys fix what we need to do to get more revenue coming in. Thank you. Thank you, officer. Seeing no one else rise, we'll now close public comment and bring it back to agenda item number two, public hearing. Authorize staff to submit to Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board the City Council proposed amendments to certain sections of 13.16 of the Lompoc Municipal Code relating to wastewater from dialysis operations. Authorize the continuation of the currently effective stay of the Kidney Center's appeal and direct staff to return with an ordinance for reading that may be recommended by the board. And now we have Utility Director Brad Wilkie for discussion. Mr. Wilkie, before you start your staff report, I did want to state for the record again, uh, that Councilmember Mosby does own property within 500 feet of this, uh, of the Kidney Center's property. The Kidney Center's appeal is one part of this item tonight. But as I explained that the last time this appeal came before the council, uh, there is no evidence and essentially no possibility that whether the Kidney Center has a water softener or not will have an impact on the value of Councilmember Mosby's property and therefore uh, he may participate in this item and does not have a conflict. Thank you for that. Um, Mayor, council members, um, audience, um, this is a staff item that's come back to you based on the motion made by the city council back at the September 3rd meeting. Uh, that motion um, was made up of three parts. Uh, it would define domestic wastewater to include dialysate and the definition of an industrial infectious waste to exclude dialysate and would allow the use of regenerative water softeners under certain conditions. Um, most of the uh, proposed ordinance was developed by the city attorney's office based on the um, minutes and the recordings of that meeting to make sure that what is in there is what uh, was proposed by Councilmember Vega. Um, one thing that we did notice was that um, included with those three items, there's still a possibility that a future uh, utility commissioner could, utility director, could make a uh, judgment that this would still be um, subject to a permit. So we also suggest to add some language that would um, alleviate any kind of concerns that not, might be uh, attached to that. And simply, I'll read a little bit of more, but uh, right now there's a um, level at which that discretion can occur, which is 10,000 gallons of effluent per day. Uh, we're suggesting that maybe include in that the proposal that goes to the water board to increase that to 25,000 gallons per day. And um, that is in response to the requirement that, it, that the authority of the grant of the director by the LMC code 1316-160, um, um, if the council wants to provide the kidney center and all other wastewater producers more flexibility, then it could also amend the uh, municipal code to limit the director's discretion by amending 13, 16, 160 to say the director only has dis discretion if the wastewater flow exceeds 25,000 gallons per day, um, which would be similar to what a class two wastewater producer is, although um, that level would apply to anybody um, based on that discretion. So it raises the um, uh, discretionary limit by that 15,000 gallons per day. Um, 
uh, if that's something that want, you would like to be added, um, it can be added to go along with the proposed ordinance change that would be going to, to the water board. Um, I guess that just leads me to the next item is the reason why we brought this back to the council before it went to the water board was just to uh, affirm and make sure that the language that is being sent is what the council uh, motion was so there's no misunderstandings. Um, so that's why I came back today for that review. And if you affirm, uh, the staff will send it over to the water board for their um, consideration. Oh, by the way, the um, Kidney Center representatives are here, are here if you have any questions for them. And I'm here to answer questions. Council Member Mosby. In the code, you added the word operate for water softening. It's unlawful to install, replace, operate, or enlarge apparatus for softening. It, why did you opt to put the word operate? Because it basically would put anybody that's in that position out. We didn't have that before. As long as you did replace or enlarge your apparatus, you could so far you know, be grandfathered in. So I'll have to defer to the city attorney's office because they put this together. Um, I think operate was probably added because it was um, recognized that that may have been the intent of what the code was originally intended to say. Uh, install Unlawful to install, replace, uh, or enlarge leaves out operate systems that are already in place when that when this code was adopted and it was probably just to try to clean that up but um, councilmember Mosby if you wanted to remove that I I don't have any legal objection to removing that I just think you know, as they naturally phase out the grandfathering component I think it would be a little more user friendly do we have any idea how many of these are left in the systems out there I don't believe we've done a complete survey of the whole entire city of um, what's out there right now. And I don't, I also don't believe we have any um, compliance um, that has been done since it was, was first done to ensure that no new ones have been put in place. Uh, so maybe, no. maybe a suggestion for a simple way to get an audit is we can contact the people who have business tax certificate that are still bringing equipment or something through here, maybe they could give us some um, some number, just maybe in the future so you, we kind of know where we are, we're sitting in this component. Any more questions for staff or the dialysis center before we open it for public comment? Council Member Vega. Uh, Mr. Wilkie, you mentioned um, that the federal guidelines, which I have, uh, pulled up the EPA's uh, description of the federal guidelines for anybody, industrial use of dis discharge of any affluents, and their guidelines are 25,000 gallons per day on average. Um, and you mentioned something about the ordinance that currently is at 10,000 gallons per day, and that could be changed if we were to go by federal guidelines instead of what the city ordinance uh, does, which is 13.16. Um, the only caveat was it would still need to be uh, affirmed by the water board. Of but course, yes. but, yeah. but we're dealing with this right now, so I want to say mm -hmm. I think 10,000 gallons, which is already measured and already looked at as being effluent in something that would be uh, waste, I think would be uh, probably over an overcharacterization of water, adding more water uh, to restrict them when I think more water doesn't necessarily mean there's more effluent, so to speak, unless water is looked at as an effluent. So I guess maybe you could tell me a little bit better. So there are I'm definitions in the code that uh, for <coughs> industrial users, um, class one and class two, of which defines the 10,000 and 25,000 gallons. This is not really related to those industrial um, characteristics. This is just to, to define when uh, a utility director can uh, make that uh, judgment call to say yes, because if it's raised to 25,000 gallons, then even if there's something that 
they would like to do less than that, they wouldn't be able to until a um, average flow goes above 25,000. So it creates a very large, a, a larger um, threshold, basically. Gotcha. And if you don't mind, I'd like to hand these uh, handouts to the city, city clerk so she can hand out the information to the rest of us, or can I go down? And basically on page two, it redefines what significant industrial users um, are subject to because the federal guidelines, again, our, our 13.16 ordinance uh, limits us at 10,000 gallons, which has probably been like that a long time, but it probably in this case because it's um, a life enhancing industry. And I think we're looking at this as a little different other than normal residential water softeners. And again, the testing that was done was done at, at the source, which wasn't a fair test, which we, I think we all uh, were in agreement that if you do it right at the source, you're not really getting the, uh, the, way, the way it should be tested at the end of the line instead of in the beginning. So what it states on the second page here second. is any other industrial user or all industrial users subject to categorical pretreatment standards over 40 CFR and 40 CFR chapter one, subchapter N, known as categorical uh, industrial users, any other industrial user that discharges an average of 25,000 gallons per day, GDP or more of processed water to the publicly owned treatment work and boiler blow down contributes a processed wastewater that makes up 5% or more of the average dry weather hydraulic or organic capacity of the POTW treatment plant. In other words, the standard minimum of 10,000 gallons is probably not going to work for a, for a business like this. I think I, I'd like to see us uh, take a look at the restriction of 10,000 gallons uh, of water per day and go with the federal guidelines based on the EPA guidelines, which are federal law. So I, was, I know we're just discussing this right here, so, uh, and then it's got to go to public comment, then it come back to us, but I just wanted to get your input on that. Again, you mentioned the 25,000 gallon threshold, and maybe the kidney dialysis center or their representatives can give their input on whether 10,000 gallons is sufficient or not as a trigger to their permitting process. I'd like to address that if I may. Please come to the microphone. Ian Guthrie, attorney for the Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center. Um, I'm a little bit frustrated at this point because our appeal was based on the fact that under your existing statute, if wastewater is domestic, it is not subject per, to permitting at all, irrespective of volume. The issue of the 10,000 gallons and 25,000 gallons only relate to industrial users, which we are not. And so when we came before you, in the presentation I made and in the appeal we presented, we went through class one users, which are the 10,000 gallon people, industrial, and significant industrial users, which are the um, 25,000 gallon limits. But, but the kidney center is none of those. It's not an industrial user. It's a domestic user. One of the council members last time I was here asked what do other jurisdictions do? So my office spent quite a bit of time looking at other jurisdictions in California, including Los Angeles, Riverside, and the city of Orange, and talking to other dialysis centers and the National Association of Dialysis Providers. And nobody in this country is using these NPDSs to try to regulate dialysis centers. Every jurisdiction either exempts medical facilities and dialysis by definition, by excluding them, which LA does, or by a specific exemption for medical facility. Nobody we've talked to other than Lompoc is trying to do this. So our proposal last time was we're domestic under your ordinance, domestic uses irrespective of volume, 
and we told you we were gonna be going up to 10,000 as we expand, just aren't subject to permitting. So we're frustrated now that the staff is taking the position, they took the position in the staff report that there was this 10,000 gallon limit. It doesn't apply. I believe the city attorney would agree with that. There's been a suggestion of going to the 25,000, which would work for us, but my frustration is that that's not what the statute says, and we're frustrated as to why is the staff trying to regulate us. I, I, I just frankly don't get it. Now, Mr. Wilkie <coughs> points to 13.16.160, which is the basic permitting statute, and it does give the, the uh, director some discretion over dischargers. Dischargers is a defined term, and it, it only includes industrial users. And it is a somewhat complicated ordinance, but if you look at the definition, you're either domestic, and it doesn't matter if it's 10,000 or 25,000 gallons, which is why the hotels and hospital aren't regulated, or you're industrial and you get regulated at, at various levels. So the, the ordinance asset is, the amendment as it's proposed solves, clarifies the definitional issue, and we appreciate that. But now the, the staff has raised this issue of 10,000, 25,000. It's a non-issue, but since they've made it one, we need some clarification. And frankly, what I propose is that we amend the ordinance further to add an exemption for medical facilities, including dialysis centers. And that solves the problem for the hospital, other medical facilities, and that sort of thing. So thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions about that? Or? No, I have a question, a further question for the city attorney now after this. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. City Attorney, um, he makes a good point that this was under a different category, and it looks like the city attorney office was uh, having a part of writing this staff report. Um, so according to his point versus residential uses, um, it seems that, that there is a, a convolution of something to prevent them from operating without a permit. Can I, can I try to explain, Councilmember Vega? Yes, sir. What we did with this ordinance is we followed the council's direction to redefine what domestic waste is so that the dialysis center's waste would be considered domestic waste. It seems that everyone is happy with that. But what my office also realized is that in the ordinance, there is kind of a catch-all that says the utility director can require a wastewater permit uh, or a permit for any user if the utility director thinks that that's appropriate. So what the staff is putting forward to you, so that would give the utility director the discretion to require a permit for the kidney center. And what the uh, staff is proposing to you tonight is that you can impose a 25,000 gallon per day threshold on the utility director's discretion. Say, the utility director has the discretion to require a permit for anyone as long as they discharge more than 25,000 gallons of water per day. Anyone who discharges less than that uh, the utility director does not have the discretion to just require a permit um, for any reason under the ordinance. So this $25,000 threshold is something that staff is proposing to you after the staff report was prepared to eliminate the uncertainty the kidney center might have about the staff coming out later and saying that they need to have a permit uh, even though they are now considered an, a domestic user. I believe the kidney center is, um, would accept that 25,000 thresh, 25, gallon threshold because I don't believe they ever expect to be discharging more than 25,000 gallons per day. So it seems to me that uh, adopting the ordinance as presented to you with the addition of the 25,000 gallon per day threshold um, that limits the utility director's discretion to require permits 
makes the kidney center happy. It is uh, acceptable to staff, or at least it's acceptable to me legally. And then we would move forward to the regional board to see if the regional board would approve that language as well. And I don't know if Mr. Guthrie has any objection to what I just said. Uh, my understanding is that he is that he wouldn't. But uh, that's my answer to your question. I got you. And you know, um, coming back with staff and staff rep recommendation, as we all know, the staff recommendation is made by uh, pretty much by some input, but. Ultimately, as it's been told to me, that it's just the util it's the utility director's call. So basically, staff recommendation is the department head or the utility director, and they've stayed strong on their course to not want to exempt a life-saving entity, which I really, it doesn't sit well with many, many people that are here uh, at the end of their life for something that's really, as it's been categorized as domestic affluent, which is, uh, just like everyone else, basically in that same category, using the restroom at their home, uh, except in, in a different area. Uh, so again, with your uh, input on this, as far as, um, as Mr. Guthrie said, uh, amending the ordinance to provide for an exemption for medical facilities, is that also an alternative on the table for us also? It is an alternative, but it re would require us to come back with another ordinance, whereas I believe the one that is before you does everything that the council is looking for and that the kidney center is looking for right now. I got you, but, but the ordinance is only satisfying the <coughs> utility director's direction. It doesn't satisfy our understanding of what domestic use, industrial work use, commercial use, so because he's using his discretion to convolute it, we can simplify it by just providing them with an exemption and allow people to live a little bit longer, people that are at the end of their life, and there's really no life-saving method for them. That is basic needs. We can go and we can help everybody in Lompoc, but we can't help people with a disease that can't be cured. I think that we need to sit back and think about this. We can certainly make it simple and say that medical uses are exempted. That is an option that the council has. But what we've already done is followed the council's direction and say that dialysis centers are domestic uses. That's in the ordinance right now. I got you. Uh, and, and for the simple fact, uh, Mr. Gu I don't know, uh, Mayor, I think the city, the attorney would like to speak over there if we can get him to address. Sure, please stand at the mic. Ian Guthrie for the uh, Kidney Center. The, I, I'm frustrated because there's, there's no need for that 25,000. It will solve the problem. So if you, you wanted to go that way, go that way. But the statute as written, 13.16.160, only applies to industrial users. It refers to, it grants the director discretion to require a permit of other users discharging discharging is defined as industrial users. So uh, we, we were shocked that they came back with this. I asked for weeks what the basis was and for the 10,000 requirement and wasn't given one. So frankly, I don't trust staff. I don't know why this is happening, but I don't trust them. And I would like an exemption, just make an exemption for medical facilities. Many cities have that. You actually have a definition of medical facility, but no reference to it in the statute. And this, this, this ordinance was probably developed from a, um, another ordinance from another city. And so you should just add that exemption, and then we won't have to be struggling with this. Thank you. I got you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Cordova. Um, my question would be for staff, for Brad. Um, in the domestic wastewater category, would, or I guess for the city attorney, would the limitation um, or the threshold be implemented based on the, on the um, discretion of the um, wastewater manager? Would that be the case in the domestic category? Would that be imposed? Yes, if, if you wanted to adopt a 25,000 gallon threshold, then for any discharge, any 
discharger that discharges less than 25,000 gallons per day, the director would not have the discretion to just require a permit. No, what the, my question is, is currently right now, uh -huh. does that discretion apply to the domestic category? Oh, yes. Okay, because it seems to me like what, what we might have an issue with is maybe we, we are either not reading the code correctly, and I, when I mean mu we is either mutual party, um, because I'm, that's what I'm understanding from the attorney for the dialysis center is, is that they're reading it and they're understanding it that that wouldn't even apply to the domestic category anyway. So why are we then putting it in here? Why does it even make a difference? So as the city attorney, are you saying then that it does effectively apply and that's what our city or, or, or Lompoc Municipal Code reads and can be verified. That's what I'm saying. Mr. Guthrie argued that the word discharge is defined in the code to mean only industrial discharges, but I do not read the def there is no definition of discharge. There's a definition of discharger that says uh, a discharger is only an industrial discharger. But we can avoid this entire argument by, by putting on the $25,000 threshold on the utility director's discretion, and then that threshold will apply to domestic and industrial uses. It solves the problem regardless of whether it's a domestic or industrial use. Or add the word industrial use. I, I'm sorry, if you're going to respond, you need to be at the mic, and, and the floor has to have been yielded by our city attorney. So. Um, if our city attorney has finished his commentary, then you can return to the microphone. I'm finished. Okay, thank you. I think one very simple solution here would be to put in the exemption for medical facilities and to limit the director's discretionary powers to impose permitting on people who use 25,000 gallons per day or more. If you take those two simple steps, I think you're done. Thank you. Councilmember Cordova, you still have the floor. I'll go ahead and wait until after public comment. Okay. Any other questions for staff or the dialysis center? Seeing none, we'll open the floor for public comment on this matter. Matthew Barron, Guardian Angels. I think I really hear what the city attorney is saying, and I, and I uh, think that on its face, this mention of the 25,000 uh, level to mitigate the director's apprehension about the whole operation is a good solution. But I think also that to add an exemption just on top of it to prevent any future problems would be a good idea. I'm not going through kidney dialysis, but there, it's a sure bet that there might be somebody in this, in this room, even on the council, whose family members are. And if I had to go through kidney dialysis, or if my family member, or even, a, even a, a, just anybody in my city had to go through, kidney dialysis, I would want them to know that Lompoc has their back. And this is just, you know, it, at the, uh, at the uh, forum on homelessness, uh, what the uh, pastor at the bridge house brought up that we have to remember beyond the codes, beyond the legal legalities, we can't, we can't just ignore, but really beyond that, this is a human issue, and this is a humane. Are we humane, or are we going to be inhumane? And to make a stink over this, when people are dying to get this treatment, if they don't get this treatment, it just seems cruel to me somehow. I, I don't know, but it just seems cruel, but I think, that, I think the, the work that our city attorney has done supports making this work, and the interest in adding an exemption, I think will secure whatever, whatever uh, discharge 
levels after they have changed. However, that will affect and protect the, the uh, preservation of the service that these people are getting. So I just think it's a human issue. These people, think of it, any, any moment, any moment, one of us could have a failed kidney. It, it, it's not uncommon. And would we want to have to travel miles every day? Do you know how hard it is? Dialysis is hard. It's hard, on, not only on the person, but on the families. And, if, and as Lompokians, we need, to, we need to provide when it's in our power, and I feel it is most definitely in our power to provide and secure this service and take the steps necessary so that the director, perhaps the director is suffering from a dilemma, but let's take the steps to give the director the ability to see a way to get it done. That's, that's what I say. Thank you. Hi, good, uh, good evening. Mar this is Marlene. I'm the head nurse of Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center for 21 years. And I heard that Lompoc people are ashamed of Lompoc. So I just want to let you know that Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center is making Lompoc famous because we are a five-star facility. We take care of our patients. And by the way, if whoever comes in there to be a dialysis patient, there's no retaliation. We will take care of you as the same as everyone, as um, the rest of our patients. Now, this is just like, uh, <laughs> let us deal with the problem to make the Lompoc better. Nothing about 25,000 gallons of water. I mean, what if we reach 26? <laughs> What's gonna happen? We're gonna have this thing again? So it's just to help everyone. And Lompoc Artificial Guinea Center is bringing revenue in Lomp city of Lompoc. We give uh, jobs to the people of Lompoc. We bring the central coast here in Lompoc. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm talking for the public and forgive me. Thank you. So I just want to let you know that, uh, which you already know, <laughs> that's why I'm facing this way, <laughs> um, that um, there's nothing else that we do at Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center but to give pride to the city of Lompoc. If you look at Hospital Compare, Lompoc Hospital has two stars. Lompoc Dialysis has five stars and we are proud and we are continue, we will continue to do our best and give all the excellent care to all our patients now and to our future patients, which may be one of you or your family. And we bring business here because we get visitors from different nations, different states. They come here because this is the only dialysis center here in Lompoc that can treat them while they're enjoying their vacation. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Dave Andrews, Mission Hills. On the one hand, we talk about the fact that Lompoc needs more revenue, but what are we doing to businesses that are in Lompoc or want to locate to Lompoc? Are we reducing rules, regulations, and zoning, or are we adding? And why are we doing that if we lessen all the requirements that don't seem to have a real purpose? It will increase our revenue at the end of the day. To hear that a bureaucrat can require a permit at his discretion is a real scary thought. Thank you.
Good evening, Council. John Lynn Lompoc, resident, without too much voice. Um, so I think two good solutions have been brought up this evening that resolve the issues within this. Uh, number one, the word operate needs to be removed. So this is a long, I could give you 20 minutes on how we got here, but there were two state laws passed. The first one's in the California Constitution. It says you have a right to potable water and you have the right to treat it. The second one <clears throat> was passed by the legislature uh, to allow cities that had impacted salt levels in their wastewater effluent to reduce water softeners. It did not give the cities the power to force people to take out existing water softeners. It allowed them to require um, specific requirements for new water softeners or expanded water softeners. So please remove that one word that's been added. That resolves that. I think the city attorney has made it clear that the solution here is to change the number from 10,000 to 25,000 average, not just 25,000 period, because one day could trip you up for 365, but average, and that it be limited to non-domestic water effluent. Um, those two things seem to me would make this pretty simple. Uh, had this come to the Utility Commission before it came to the Council, I think we probably could have worked this out back then and saved you guys a lot of time, but it didn't, so here we are. Uh, just an interesting stat, 5% of our flow at the wastewater plant is about 125,000 gallons. So by moving it to 5% 5 or 5,000 gallons, whichever is greater, clearly we're not going to impact our plant. And we don't want to do that. This will solve these, these two issues. And then we, you guys can move on to the next big one. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Nicholas Gonzalez, resident of Lompoc. The spirit of law and then the letter of the law. We often talk about economic development and promoting business. One of the biggest things that is repetitively told to me um, from people from the outside is Lompoc always is very focused on the letter of the law and they've completely lost the spirit of the law. In some circumstances, the letter of the law is very important. You know, I get angry, I just can't come up to you and punch you. If I cannot do certain things and it's very specific and there's very specific reasons for it. We understand the intent of what you're trying to do, but it is really important that as a city we start to embrace more of the spirit of the law and as long as we can reach the intent of what the letter of the law is, that we start giving some flexibility. We are known throughout areas outside of our town as being way too restrictive on the letter of the law and always not being open to embracing the spirit of the law and embracing ways in which we can do things. It's always why we can't do things. It's in the building department at times. It's been in the planning department at times. We see it here today in this division. So please, 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 for the betterment of this community, start to embrace the spirit of the law as much as you can and make things happen. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll bring it back to discussion by council and uh, recommendations. Councilmember Vega. Yeah, after uh, listening to all the discussion, and thank uh, the Kidney Dialysis Center and the City Attorney and Wastewater Director for their input, it seems to me that the, I would like to believe that we're all on the same page here, and we are compassionate toward the people that need help in Lompoc. People that are at their, the end of their life, these people are trying to provide a dignified way for these people to go through treatment. I see even the access is, is done in a way to the Kidney Dialysis Center in a way so that the people can retain and still maintain their dignity. Um, I just think the only thing here that we could possibly do here is uh, to clarify things because domestic effluent discharge and the industrial, okay, it's different. But I think that if, I, I would like to make a motion that we provide a, uh, change the ordinance to provide 
an exemption for medical facilities. I think the second suggestion was also taken well to amend the ordinance to provide for an exemption that would limit or the discretionary powers of the director to uses over 25,000 gallons. Yes, we can adopt the 25,000 gallons, but it, it's, it's, it, it's mixed up because it's based on someone's discretion. I'd like to have it clarified so that we can know that we do uh, recommend and we kind of, and we do support the people that need help in Lompoc at all, at all walks of life. We're helping other people, but we won't help, help some people. We need to help people here that are at the end of life, they're going through treatment, their dignity is important. If any of you have had any family members that are suffering or have passed or, and you've seen the end of life, it's not, it's not nice. It's really not nice, but it's inevitable. So those are my two recommendations that we, we change the ordinance to provide an exemption for our medical facilities and that we amend the ordinance to provide for discretionary powers for the wastewater director over 25,000 gallons, not below. Uh, Council Member Vega. Yes, sir. I need to ask, do or, you, yeah, I got you. Do you, I understand your motion, but I need to ask, do you still want to have the amendments that we've made to make the kidney center waste domestic waste instead of industrial waste, or do you want to scrap those? Uh, I think the domestic waste is where we categorized, and, and unless, Unless we have uh, something that's suggested that won't work for the kidney dialysis center, uh, I'd like to have their input to see if, if that would be something they can live with because we're here to help. So if, uh, if the mayor would allow uh, maybe someone to give us some input from the kidney artificial kidney center, I, I'd like to hear it. So given we have moved to discussion and motion, uh, I, I don't believe that that's fair because we've already had public comment. So I realize what you're looking to do is accommodate the dialysis center and what the city attorney has told you is that the current recommended ordinance update does accommodate their initial request. Now you're making a request for a different change that accommodates their original request and now creates conflict by creating one exemption versus... It, it doesn't necessarily create conflict. It's just exemption on top of... Right. Exemption on top of uh, change to definition. Maybe not are all necessary, but it's a very, very belt and suspenders approach to exempting the kidney center from this ordinance. So maybe I can ask you, since I'm not being allowed to clarify so that I can make a good decision, okay? So it's based on the mayor supporting staff's recommendation regardless of my request, okay? Maybe I can address it to the city attorney to maybe you can express what would be a simple solution to this uh, do, uh, based on my recommendations. Uh, a simple solution is what the staff has in the staff report. I, I know. And, I, I got you. And adding on the $25,000 limit on the utility director's discretion. If you wanted to uh, also have a simple exemption from, from medical facilities, I, I'm, I have no legal issue with putting that into what we can present to the regional board. Um, I would question maybe whether staff might the wastewater staff might have an issue with that because medical facilities is, can be broad. I mean, we'd be exempting uh, hospitals, we'd be exempting all doctor's offices, we'd be exempting dentist's offices. Uh, I, I, I don't have the expertise to know whether uh, we would want to do that, and, but wastewater staff I got may. you. I'd, li I'd like to let the council make this decision. I think we've vetted it long enough. I'd like to have the exempt. At least on, on, the, on the first issue, I'd like to uh, have us make a change that we provide an exemption for medical facilities, just like any other city may have. That would be one. The other one, again, if we're going to change and we're going to allow the um, wastewater manager to use his discretion to put someone in a permit process, then I think that it's, it's prudent to say above 25,000 gallons for him before he, it's triggered that he can impose that permit process. So we have your motion on the floor. Any other comments before? No, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, I'd give you a second if you would add just 
modify it simply that uh, the, ten, the 25 gallons per day was an averaging. So if you'd add that as an average, and likewise, if you would um, take out the word operate that they added in here as well. Um, and along with going along with your motion was also the, the changes and recommendations that the city attorney had put in here, the un underlying components here. So that way you give them a couple layers of protectionism. And you know this is a petition to the state board. If they don't like it, they come back and we adjust accordingly. But I would give you okay. a second. Okay, yeah, the word operate into, into <coughs> those other changes, yes. I will amend my motion to include those. Okay, I'll give you a second. Council Member Cordova. Um, is there a consideration uh, from the council that instead of just having the broad term uh, where we are um, saying that there is uh, all medical facilities that we could say any life-saving medical establishments um, that they be exempt from and that would maybe perhaps help to mitigate some of the other normal doctor's offices that would not necessarily need to be exempt from the code. Council Member Mosby. I think the complexity to that is if you state it as life saving, because then you're getting in a, a, a you know battle of words. So well, I, I think it's just as complex to say that we're going to do every medical facility, and um, you know we're we're basing it off of uh, information brought forth by the attorney of the dialysis center saying that these other cities have it, but we haven't read those codes. So I think that if we at least understood, and sometimes I feel like that's where this city goes wrong, is that we're not fully um, you know, educated ourselves on our own code and how we interpret it and having the discretion of a particular director. Um, when we get a new director, that person can have a totally different um, feeling or thought, and then we don't, on top of that, we don't always keep a proper record of what we've allowed in the past. And so, it, again, the complexity is there. Um, I was just saying that maybe to come to a, um, you know, reasonable accommodation, we could say, you know, a life-saving medical facility would be exempt, such as dialysis centers or such as, you know, but, but a regular doctor's office or a dentist's office, as the attorney said, they wouldn't need to be exempt from the code. If, if I may, maybe another option is for the staff to bring back to the council or to look at the codes of other cities and bring back to the council how they define their medical uh, uh, use exemptions and then see if we would want to use that definition <coughs> as well. And at the end of the day, the dialysis center, the attorney, um, has stated that the 25,000 gallons, that that, that, that would suffice what their operation is. Um, so I feel like in a way the staff report is allowing them to be able to do their functions and it is giving them the, um, the domestic category as far as the wastewater discharge. Um, moving it up to the 25,000 average, I, I believe in that too, but I just thought that maybe, I know that you guys want to see a complete elimination of medical facilities, but being the fact that the attorney brought forth you know, not having enough information, if you guys would be open to that, um, that would be a consideration to, to perhaps maybe go back, review that portion of it, and then bring it back. Council Member Mosby. I think what they're looking at in the spirit of it again is about the domestic component and saying that that a medical is a domestic component, it's not an industrial that they're looking at. And I, I, I can see, um, granted, it would be nice to have other um, cities' policies in front of them, ordinances in front of them, but um, I don't necessarily think we need to delay this longer. Um, again, it's a recommendation that, that we're putting forward and um, yeah, we got to see if the, the board's going to want to accept what we're moving forward with. Um, and I think to try to, the, the challenging part is you're, you, you qualify life-saving medical. Um, at where do you draw the line at life-saving? Uh, it wasn't too long ago the number one killer out there was tooth decay. So, I mean, 
a lot of what the dentists would, would say is that they're doing is life-saving. Uh, you know, so I, I think you would get in a, a very sticky definition of what would be a qualifier of that, but I, I'd be willing to stay with the same motion that we had, and we see as different recommendation that comes back. Um, maybe we can do an adjustment later, but I think right now we have something relatively uh, simple to move forward with, and, and I think that we've... Um, can go forward. If we, if we see something different, we can change it later. But I, I think this is solid the way it's written or, or with the motions. Councilmember Cordova. But to be clear, we're not changing the uh, category for all medical facilities. Um, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, the definition of domestic wastewater to include dialysate. So we're being specific to the dialysis center, right, with this... Uh, Resolution? Uh, well, the proposed amendment does change the definition of domestic waste to include dialysis waste. In addition to that, what, what the motion on the floor tonight is, is to add another exemption to, for a permit, exemption to the permit requirement for medical uses. Right, I understand that. So that's the, that's the additional component that my fellow council members are putting up. But the actual uh, recommendation brought forth before the council was only to change or to include the domestic wastewater for dialysate, not necessarily all medical facilities. So I Correct. just wanted to make that point. Correct, yes. Any more discussion or questions before we, council member Mosby? And this would have to come back for a second reading before it moved forward, would it? So this is actually not even the first reading because okay. this is just to get the council's okay on the ordinance and then we submit it to the regional board and then we bring it back to you if they approve okay. for a first reading. So I think there's time to, go to, to correct if we need to down the road, but I think that it's a doable motion. So a quick question to the city attorney, though, is once it goes to the Water Region Board and they make a recommendation and any changes it's brought back, if we make another drastic change, it has to go back to the Water Regional Board based on potential denial of any of this, correct? Yes, and we don't know how they're going to react. If, if they approve the ordinance that we present to them, then that's great. We'll just adopt it. If they say... We do not approve this and we want you to change this and that and it's very clear what they want changed then that's easy we can just change it and get their approval and then you can adopt it but if they just say no then we really don't have any direction from them and the council will have to decide what to do at that point okay. council member vega um mr city attorney um when when this is submitted to the regional water board Who's the one doing the submission, and who's the one communicating with the water board here as far as the city staff is concerned? Is it you and your office, or is it the wastewater who's actually made the recommendation is not in favor of what we're doing, okay? So how do we provide that the kidney dialysis center is getting a fair shake as far as presentation to the regional water board? Uh it can come from me, it can come, what, what usually would be done is it would be wastewater staff, because that's their area of expertise in consultation with me if they have legal issues. But if the council preferred the administration to handle that or preferred the city attorney's office to handle that, then we can do that. I, I personally would prefer the city attorney's office to handle that so it's fair and impartial and for transparency purposes. Uh, I think it's, it's fair so the public sees. Uh, that whatever the outcome is, is the outcome. If you want to make that part of your motion, you can. I'd like to make that part of my motion. If I could amend that. You may amend it. It just requires the individual who made I'll this. I'll second. There we go. Any more questions or discussion? Any other clarification from the city attorney? I just feel like I have to say that um, we're we're the motion is to put in an exemption for medical facilities. And there's, we don't have a definition of that right now. And uh, I don't want to create a definition of that without bringing it back to council to get it approved. So if you don't want it to come back to council before we go to the regional board, 
it's just going to say medical facilities are exempt. And I don't know for sure, but I feel like the regional board might think that that is broad. Uh, but I, I, I feel like I would like to create some kind of definition of medical facilities and have the council approve that. Um, but it's, that's just my legal advice to you. It's not something that has to be followed in the council's discretion. Uh, but I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about just using the simple term medical facilities. No, you may not. I'm sorry. We're in deliberation about a motion that's on the floor, so discussion has ended. Um, so we have a motion. It's been seconded. Any other questions or concerns before we call for a vote? Let me uh, just make sure that included in that motion is what the rest of the items under staff recommends here in the first page of the staff report. So st staff is going to take the motion as amended by council, take the ordinance as amended by council's motion and submit that to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, I'd also like to ask that staff recommendation number two is included in the motion, which is to continue the stay on the Kidney Center's appeal until the Kidney Center withdraws the appeal or the city receives notice from the regional board of its outright rejection of the proposed changes to the wastewater ordinance and then direct staff to return the to return to the city council with the ordinance as amended tonight at the next city council meeting following confirmation by the regional board of that ordinance or with any changes that the board uh, that the regional board may indicate Councilmember Meg, I need you to accept that recommendation. Yes. Councilmember Mosby? Yes. Thank you. So, moved, seconded, recommendations. Any other discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. <coughs> and that passes 3 2. All right. Next item is adoption of resolution number 627719, amending the development impact fees to be assessed against projects for accessory dwelling units, presented by our city attorney, Jeff Malave. Evening, Mayor and Council. This item is related to uh, impact fees that the city charges for accessory dwelling units. On the City Council meeting of October 1st, the Council reviewed a proposed method for calculating ADU fees that was presented to the Council at that meeting. And it was also explained to the Council at that meeting that currently, or at that time currently, in the state legislature was a bill, Senate Bill 13, that would have mandated how cities calculate and impose impact fees on ADUs. We did not know at the time whether that bill was going to be signed by the governor. Uh, it had passed both houses. And so the council continued the item to a future date when we uh, would know what the governor decided to do on that bill. The governor signed Senate Bill 13 on October 9th, so now we have a state-mandated process and formula for how we must uh, impose, calculate and impose impact fees on ADUs. What that state law says is that for ADUs that are 750 square feet or, <coughs> sorry, ADUs that are under 750 square feet, the city may not charge any impact fees. For ADUs that are 750 square feet or larger, the impact fees charged to the ADU have to be proportional to, uh, by size, to the size of the single family res residence or other residence that is located on the parcel. So what that would mean in, uh, as an example is you would take the proposed square footage of the ADU, you would divide that by the square footage of the residence that already exists on the parcel, 
and that would result in a fraction, say 32%. If it resulted in 32%, then the ADU would be charged 32% of all of our uh, residential dwelling impact fees. <coughs> if the ADU is 750 square feet or greater. And again, if it's under 750 square feet, we cannot charge any impact fees. So the resolution before you tonight is to adopt that system for calculating and imposing ADU fees that is required by state law now. State law goes into effect on January 1st, 2020. And the staff recommendation is to adopt resolution 627719 after holding a public hearing. I'm available for questions. Any questions for our city attorney before we open it to public comment? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and open the floor for public comment. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Lance Armstrong. I've been in the real estate business here for uh, along the Central Coast for 45 years. I've built homes, office buildings, I owned a brokerage company, mortgage company. I'm the founder of a title insurance company. So I have a broad range of experience in real estate business. And I'm very interested in this. I own property here in Lompoc as well. Uh, I think this ADU um, proposal and what has been mandated by the state can be very beneficial, particularly to a city like Lompoc. I think that this ADU uh, proposal can really benefit uh, particularly those of more modest incomes because of the square footage uh, um, uh, requirements under this guideline that there, my understanding is, and I haven't read the whole state guideline, but my understanding is there's a maximum of 1,200 square feet and that there's no fees below seven, 750 which is great. That's an incentive for people to build lots of units under 750. Um, I see some problems with this definition, though, and I, I, think, I think I understand uh, what the city attorney explained there, that, that it, the fee is to be based on a percentage of a ratio of, of the ADU to the unit that's already existing on the lot. Well, one problem is, what if there is no existing unit on the lot? You have to discuss that problem. But... Um, what if you have two properties, property A and property B, two different owners? One property has a, has a home on it existing of 2,000 square feet. The house next door has a primary existing residence of 1,000 square feet, and they both build a 1,000 square foot ADU. Well, the, house, the property with 2,000 square feet is going to pay 50% of the fee. The house with 1,000 square feet is going to pay 100% of the fee, even though they built the exact same unit, 1,000 square feet and 1,000 square feet, the impact fee should be no greater for one than the other because the uh, impact is obviously identical. Yet the fee is twice as much for the person with the smaller primary residence. Uh, that doesn't seem fair at all. And I, I can't imagine that someone won't contest that at some point uh, throughout this ADU development process. So it's, a, it's an issue I think needs to be discussed before you just approve this um, uh, immediately. Uh, another issue to be thought about, oh boy, I'm running out of time. This three minute thing is ridiculous for an issue this large, but um, is there's also a provision for multifamily uh, dwellings where you can add an ADU, which what is the fee gonna be based on? The multifamily fee is it gonna be based on the single family fee, that ratio? Uh, which is going to be the primary unit to determine the ratio? Is it the 1,000 square foot unit existing? Is it the 800 unit square foot unit existing? Uh, which unit are you going to use to develop the fee? Um, if I may, uh, just have a minute and I'll close real quickly. Um, Please wrap it up as quick as possible. Okay, I will. You have an opportunity here to either incentivize people to build these or disincentivize people. There's a drastic need for housing, particularly low-cost housing in Lompoc. Uh, this is a great opportunity for people to uh, develop some new units and put some downward pressure on these rents that are ridiculous, I think, uh, in my experience. I don't see how the people of average income here are even surviving other than check to check. Uh, it's got to be tough with this rental market. 
So hopefully if you build enough units, we can put some downward pressure on those, on those rentals. And I'm saying that as a rental owner, uh, my son self-defeating. But in the long run, you're gonna get higher property value assessments by the new development. You're gonna create jobs for development of housing. You're gonna get more sales tax revenue by the purchase of materials to build this housing. And you're gonna get property tax revenues increased because of the higher assessed values. So I would suggest you strongly incentivize this ADU process and uh, get some more rental housing developed for the people of Lompoc. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Diane Long. Um, I just have a real concern about the way the resolution is worded. It's, it's not clear at all. If I'm a consumer and I'm reading on the website, how my, how, what are my fees going to be for an ADU? It says in a manner that is proportionate. Well, what manner and what proportion? As a consumer, I don't know that. We all may know because we've been involved in the issue for some time now. But I think it needs to be ex exactly clear in that resolution what percent is and what the manner is so I can calculate it by myself. I don't have to rely on the interpretation of wh whoever happens to be sitting behind the desk on that day as to what that fee is. And then the next guy comes along and says, well, no, that's not how I interpret it. I interpret it this way. So I think that resolution needs to be taken another look at and make sure that is extremely clear. Um, and also, I would strongly suggest, and, and I'm sure you would all agree, that all of these fees need to be published on your website and at the front desk, clearly, so if I'm gonna build a house, I can walk in and look at what the fee is, calculate it, and put it in my budget, and that's where I'm gonna be. It, it can't be open-ended, it can't be tell you later, build the house now, it just needs to be really, really clear, so people try and do business in this community know where they're at. It can't be, I don't trust when I walk in there what I'm told. So if you would take that in consideration and really look at the wording on that resolution, I think it's very unclear and extremely vague. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Gonzalez, resident of Lompoc. In addition to the most recent change, there was also a change that provided for both an ADU and a junior ADU, in essence, changing any single family residentially zoned property to potentially to a triplex, three, three units. And you haven't discussed how you're gonna address the fees for that third unit, potentially. Um, again, spirit of the law, letter of the law, and you're rushed to be able to collect fees. You're embracing the spirit of the law. HUD, Housing and Urban Development, has a new term. It's called unintended disparate impact. Uh, the way that you're going to calculate your fee, you're going to be calculating your fee disparately upon people with lower incomes and in certain segments because of the propensity for them to own smaller and more affordable homes. I think you're going down a dangerous path that could have some legal consequences if challenged. Um, I'm not an attorney. That's just what I read from HUD's new uh, guidelines and disparate unintended impacts for housing. So I would be careful to look at in, into that realm when you're designing your ordinance because the proportionality does not make sense. If it's on an impact, how do you have two charges for the equivalent impact? I would like to hear some feedback on, on that. So same size unit, charged a different fee. So um, the other thing is, is this meets many of your general plan requirements, infill, affordable housing, um, having more dense housing, it it, it's gonna create additional housing stock. I, er, er, the previous gentleman went into ma many of the issues, um, but I really think you need to sit back, look at all the recent laws that have changed, and then formulate a policy that is fair and equitable and does not have any disparate impact on anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Daryl Tullis, Salon Polk resident. Um, I just got a couple of questions. First of all, when we're looking at these ADUs, uh, and I'm assuming that that's an additional dwelling unit, correct? Correct. Okay. A lot of times we use these acronyms, come from the military, and 
I hate it when I hear acronyms and nobody says exactly what it is and a lot of people. Accessory dwelling unit, see that's why, see. So okay, accessory dwelling unit, uh, which first of all says to me that you've already got a unit on that property. So there was a comment made earlier about a piece of property that has nothing on it. Uh, that's why I wanted to clarify that. But my question about what was this new ordinance, first of all, how many additional or accessory dwelling units can you put on one piece of property? Because say for instance, you have a piece of property, um, I used to own a property on, on C Street that was a sixth of an acre, and I had an, an accessory unit on that property, but that piece of property was big enough to put two or three 750 square foot uh, accessories on there. So how many are you allowed to have? And let's say for instance a piece of property, a, a person puts an 800 square foot dwelling on their property and next door they put two 750 foot square foot pieces of, of uh, accessory dwelling units, ADUs. Uh, that impact is gonna be greater for the two 750s versus the one 800. So I think to just use an arbitrary number like 750, and I know it's coming from the, from the state, but it's still something that needs to be addressed and needs to be explained. And another thing I would like to see happen is when percentages are used talking about you know, fees, and an example is given of 32%, blah, 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 add a dollar value to those uh, examples so that when we hear it, Hearing 32% doesn't really give you, you know, the picture of what it's actually going to cost. So if we could just get with those examples, get a dollar amount added to those examples. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll return this discussion back to council. Council Member Cordova. <coughs> so question for our city attorney. Um, the uh, resolution that we that is before us right now would essentially be adopting the state um, recommended or the now the state code. It's no longer a recommendation; it's a state code. Is that correct? That is correct. And does that particular state code does it have a restriction or uh, a number of uh, a maximum number of ADU dwelling units? Um, on a particular property? I do not believe so. Okay. And does it allow for multifamily or is it just single family dwelling units? Uh, you, you mean an ADU on a property that has a multifamily dwelling? No, the other way around. Someone mentioned something about, well, what if it's a multifamily dwelling? Um, oh, a multi can it be a multifamily dwelling? Multifamily ADU. Mm hmm. <clears throat> I do not know the answer to that question, but I, th I think it can. Okay. Um, that's all I have for right now. Council Member Mosby. So question on a, on a fee for, if you're building an ADU with a multifamily unit that's already on there, how do you impose that as the percentage of the total? I mean, do you, do you pick one of the, if it's a triplex and you're putting an ADU on it? Is that an allowable? Uh, I, I believe you would use the square footage of the entire triplex. Well, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't know the answer to that question either, for sure. And I, um, and I know a lot of the stuff just came out and it's to try to read it myself and try to find, there's a lot of interpretations that are coming sideways on, on this. Um, and one of the, the, the components that's amazing is the arbitrary part of the calculation. And it, it, it was a concern from the public. And, and you know, it's, it's not us who's doing it. It's state law that says that you have to use this percentage calculation. So that's, uh, is, that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The examples that were given about different fees being charged to two different ADUs that are exactly the same square footage, that can happen, but that is something that's required for us to do by the state. And uh, if the city were to get sued over that, we would simply say that it is something the state's requiring us to do, and the plaintiff, uh, their remedy would be to sue the state. 
Right. So we're just trying to do what we're told to do. Right. Our hands are kind of tied there. Uh, there's referencing a junior ADU. Do we have to bring back a resolution uh, with the junior ADU component, or is that same calculation for impact fees? So a junior ADU is anything 500 feet or less, so it doesn't fall into requiring fees. Under the new state law, it would Under not. The, yeah. Right. So do we need to put that verbiage in here, or we just assume that it's... Uh, a, a even junior, though they call it a junior, it's still a... It's a type of ADU, so it would fall under the... So we're policy. okay with this ordinance? Okay. Um, and how many per parcel? Did we... Do we know that one? I don't believe there's a limit in the state law <clears throat> for the number of ADUs per parcel. And that would be something that was in state law anyway, so it's not something that we're creating. We're, we're kind of limiting in our... When, capacity of what we have here with the ordinance, but we're piggybacking on what already is state existing law, correct? Yeah, we're, we're certainly not imposing any limit <clears throat> on the number of ADUs per parcel tonight. Okay. Um, I think that hit all the questions, I believe. Thank you. Council Member Vega. Um, Jeff, what discretionary powers and flexibility do we have under state law locally here to standardize our fee schedule where it's not based, or do we have that discretion to not base it on someone's residence or primary residence when they build add-on? Um, there must be some caveat or flexibility in our fee schedule from which the way we calculate our fees, we've done everything else uh, we've always calculated our fees based on our needs because how would city staff be able to calculate all these separate variables, uh, especially with the, it seemed like it would be a nightmare for you guys to come up with the fee schedules and then you would never be able to give someone the warm and fuzzy that they could afford to build out these units and you might provide, it might come up and, and turn into a hardship, something that should be something uh, beneficial to someone's elderly family, someone's handicapped family, they should know. Uh, and it's a good point. You know, I don't think you want someone to come up at the counter and then uh, always wonder what what's next and who the next building inspector or planning person is going to require. Uh, we should be able to, uh, we probably shouldn't even do anything unless we can standardize something and give somebody the warm and fuzzy. That's not even good business. I think that's what gives us uh, a different take on on uh, when people are afraid to come to City Hall and they leave wandering with a question mark and I think city staff is probably left that way also, you know, so they have to have meetings to see what's fair and what what it should be. Um, so I'm not sure if we're, if it's too soon, Jeff, or what do we do here? How do, what, we, I, I guess the question really, was the flexibility part of it. We don't really have a lot of flexibility. The state law says that for under 750 square feet, we have to charge zero. So that's easy. For yeah, over 750 easy. square feet, we, we have to charge as proportional to the existing dwelling unit on the site. So Now the proportion, is that in state law also, or is that something that locally is set? Well, the, the state law says proportional to the existing dwelling so unit. So proportional could be a percentage that's perceived and implemented and adopted here locally. Well, that's what we're doing tonight. We're, no, I we're got you, I got you. I'm just clarifying this, that's why we're here. Yeah. It's clarifying, hey, could it be 40%, 50%, 60%? I guess that's my question. Well, we can't set a hard and fast percentage for every application because you have to look at what's the size of the ADU versus the size of the existing dwelling. When you do the ratio of those two, that gives you your percent. I got you. you. So the law is meant to keep you at 750 or under. Otherwise, you're probably going to wish you didn't do it. Not necessarily. I mean, I think the state is trying to encourage ADUs. So it is saying for small ADUs under 750, no fees. For ADUs over 750, you don't have to pay the full impact fee for a residential dwelling that a city would normally charge you. You get to pay this proportional fee that's, that, is, that can be yeah. much less. And I, and I appreciate your answer. I just, it doesn't sit well with me if somebody has a huge house 
and then someone has a small house, but they're just converting their garage into an ADU, you know, that's uh, 800 square feet. I think that was the, you know, some sort of an example. All of a sudden it triggers the, the difference in fees that are paid. Um, so, all right, thanks. Councilmember Cordova. Um, the proportionate fees, when we're discussing those, are is do you know if that calculation is based on the, I guess, the current development fee schedule for that property, or would it be based on when that actual development took place, the original residential unit? Uh, it's based on the current. Current. Okay. So a couple of the questions that have been asked, I went and looked up the answers. For floor area ratio, it's couple of things based on existing zoning and then 10% of additional for an ADU built on lots smaller than 10,000 square feet. For lot coverage, it's based first on existing zoning and then 5% additional for an ADU built on lots smaller than 10,000 square feet. Regarding maximum unit size, up to 12,000 square feet or the floor area of the primary residence, whichever is less. Regarding minimum Unit size, up to 12,000 square feet of the floor area of the primary resident, or whichever is less. Number, one ADU may be allowed per single family dwelling on a single family or multi-family zoned lot. An ADU and a junior ADU may occur on the same lot. Owner occupancy is not required for the ADU or primary residence. Parking. One, parking space is required for newly constructed units unless the unit is within a half mile of public transit such as a train station and all bus stops created within the area of an existing building or in a historic district. Rental. They can be rented for up to periods of 30 days or more. They can have a, and must have, a, sorry, a separate in, exterior entrance is required. On the junior ADU, ADU, it is a separate, but it can also be an interior access through a main living room or primary as, area of residence. The setback for the front yard for the ADU, not the junior, is same as existing zoning with no additional setback required for an existing garage that is converted to an ADU. And setback rear and side yards are same for existing zoning or five feet, whichever is less, a maximum setback of five feet may be allowed for ADU constructed above an existing garage. So the state has looked into and made sure to limit how many are gonna end up on a piece of property and really limit and hopefully limit the size of them to not be any larger than 1,200 square feet because the whole purpose again is that keyword accessory dwelling unit. So I, I, I know what everyone's concerned about and we're frustrated that the mandate's coming down from the state, but I think um, if we can embrace the recommendation and move forward on it, there's some ideas out there that um, I will put in a council request for that are separate from this that might ease how this moves forward. There's some successes going on in other communities that I'd like to make a council request on, but I think we need to complete this item first and then move on to um, the rest of our agenda. So any other questions for staff? Any other concerns or discussions? Um, council Member Starbuck. A separate item about, <coughs> excuse me, one, one of the, I have concern with is the fees that we've already collected. We, we had four ADUs applied for, all less than 750 square foot, therefore exempting them from paying impact fees that we collected. So what would be the proper way to ask for a refund for the, the four ADUs that have been applied for? Uh, if the council wants to request to have a future agenda item to waive and refund the fees for those four uh, uh, ADUs, then you can make a council request to do that. Uh, if you wanted to make a council request that says they need to come forward and request the refund, you could do that too. So again, we have item three that we need to close out and then we could move on to public comment and then council requests at which time we can handle that. So I will go ahead and make the motion to adopt the resolution of number 627719, amending the development impact fees to be assessed against projects for accessory dwelling units. Council Second. Member Mosby. 
And I have a second. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Any written communications? Nothing. Thank you. Uh, we'll now open the floor for oral communications of two minutes maximum regarding city matters. Seeing no one rise, we will close oral communications and move it to council comments and meeting reports. Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, I represent the city of Lompoc both at the Air Pollution Control District and Santa Barbara County Association of Government meeting. Um, for those who have seen, there's a, there's a map that the city clerk put out on the bulletin board showing the project list that's moving forward. Um, and you, did you, you posted the fact sheet as well? And the fact sheet showing what's going on on our roads and uh, the five-year trend on collisions, injuries, and fatalities. Uh, the interesting with the map about projects moving forward is uh, Robinson Bridge, along with my help and uh, Supervisor Adam help and, and SB CAG staff, the Robinson Bridge uh, project has qualified for what they call shop funds, which is state highway operations and protection program, uh, which moves the bridge replacement uh, along with some Highway 246 um, replacements. What was scheduled for 2038, 2039, it's moved it forward to uh, 2026 and 2027, which is a significant movement forward towards replacement um, of the Robinson Bridge and some of the Highway 246 improvements. So if you have time, look at the bulletin board out there. Um, if not, as well, I have the papers here. Um, one item that I had requested before in the past was a discussion um, of a home buyer assistance program uh, moving forward, something similar to what Santa Barbara has. Uh, they call it a, um, and this assistance program is for the city employee component. And I know we're having difficulty with uh, public safety qualifying, especially the, some of the newer people that, that come in. Uh, Santa Barbara has a program they call a um, Employee Mortgage Loan Assistance Program. Maybe we could have a discussion of implementing something similar to that with the city. It, maybe it'll help uh, stimulate some of the movement forward. Uh, Santa Barbara's doing it. They, they initiated it in 2001. So maybe this is a program and, and for two other people we could initiate discussion with ideas like this and other ideas that the city manager might be able to bring forward. Um, I don't know exactly the full success that Santa Barbara has with it, but um, they basically ask, uh, to, it helps with the, the second on the properties to, to help stimulate and keep employees here. So. Two other council members would like to initiate discussion, something similar like that. Uh, I think it'd be something we'd I'll worth second. looking at. I'll give you a third. Okay. Thank you. Council member Starbuck. I have no reports and one council request. Bet you can't guess what it is. Um, I'd like to get a request through that we could go ahead and discuss rebating some of the already collected fees on some of these ADUs that are currently in the system. I'll give you a second. Third. Yes, we needed a third. Thank you. Councilmember Vega. Um, I, I would like to make a request here, but I have a request that our uh, council request, uh, there's many of these that haven't come back in such a long time. Um, anything that's over three or four months out, I'd like us to take another look at these because I think some of the method to the madness is uh, no one takes them serious or we can't agendize. We can agendize some frivolous items sometimes, but we can't agendize the council requests. And I'd like the city, uh, maybe the attorney, we can figure out some way of accelerating some of this uh, because I have things that are on the books here that, you know what, it's coming, it's running off the page now. so. Um, like to at least make that comment. That's what we can do. Thank you. 
City Manager. Oh, I was just going to say I, I do agree. There, there is a lot of requests on this page, and it is going on to the second page. A lot of it goes back to we don't have as many staff as we used to have, so we're trying to continue forth with what we can. What I might do is try and bring back an item that asks the council to prioritize these because they can't all be number one when you have a whole page or more of requests. So that might be something that we can have a discussion on, on which ones do we want to focus on first, you know, pick the top three or five, and then we keep going through them, but we do have a, a large number of them. I got you, but you know, instead of proclamations and things that are frivolous and things like that, I think we need to take it a little more serious, our requests. I think the city attorney said that we can actually mandate and put a date certain instead of the shortage of staff. I think sometimes the agenda, the agendas that we have sometimes don't reference it. This is all in case we ever want to put something on here. It's kind of like extra. Maybe the city attorney can clarify how these city, these council requests are being looked at and in, in, in if they're taken serious. Uh, you're right, Council Member Vega, you can include in a council request a date that you would like it to come back. Uh, but it has to be physically possible in order to bring it back by that date. And so when you make that council request, sometimes staff may have input about whether it's possible to bring it back in time. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say is that I believe that staff does take all of these seriously and I know that the ones that I have on my plate I am working diligently to bring back to the council. Uh, I can say the same for the rest of the departments in the staff. Um, we talk every morning after council meetings about what items we're going to bring back and are able to bring back uh, from this list uh, after every council meeting. I got you, but city attorney, you know, we have these requests for a reason and I get it. Um, but our past experience shows some of them never come back. They just fall off the edge of the earth and that's what I'm trying to prevent here. Okay, so I just wanted to make that uh, with a little bit more clarity. I think that everyone here, we're trying to work together. I know you're working hard, but I don't think it's a priority for staff. And I'd like it to be a little bit more of a priority to include one or two of these instead of some frivolous items that come up on, on, on uh, some of these things. Some of the things, if you read the council handbook, some of the staff reports that come up, sometimes it's, they're not in, expected to be re read or even a, it's not a requirement to be read in, in the entirety. Sometimes staff reports come out and they're here right in front of us and they're available here to be read by the public. So sometimes maybe we can take another look at how staff presents sometimes to make sure that it's not a long-winded staff report that's being read right here when it's already been handed out and we've already gotten it ahead of time. So just a point taken and I got that out of the council handbook. Thank you. Councilmember Cordova. I attended on um, October 24th the Vandenberg Cordley Awards and also had a meeting with um, some city staff in regards to a possible planning for uh, launch viewing um, of a mission for December of 2020. And it's all just initial conversations, but um, working together to see how we can continue to support Vandenberg and continue to support the tourism and try to improve um, the money that we can bring into the city. Councilmember Mosby. I just want to make a comment on, on Councilmember Vega's item. I have one item on the list here that fell off that came back was actually from, I think it was October 21st, 2015. So, um, I know, I know everybody's busy and, and such, but even if it could come back at a, at a quick synopsis or a smaller component, so we can get them off the list. Which one, just out of curiosity, which one, because that was well before my time, which one was? This was about the um, enforcement of Health and Safety Code 8-04-04, I think it's section B, C, and D, um, which was, thou shalt not dig in the garbage can. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. I attended the League of California Cities, um, which was paid for by the city. I attended the Vandenberg Air Force Base quarterly luncheon. 
I did participate in the Make a Difference Day. Thank you so much to all of the community. It was amazing to see the number of turnout. And thanks to Supergirl for providing the food that day. Um, I know that they had several runs back to get more supplies. There were so many volunteers. I attended the 55th anniversary for Grace Temple Missionary Church and participated in the city executive meeting for SBCAG to make appointees to the regional board for um, the housing issues that will be discussed and monies allotted. Um, the appointees, one was from large city and that would be Mayor Patino and one from a small city and that was Mayor Julian Aristod from Guadalupe and they will be representing our entire region along with three other counties in what's called a super region. I also attended the Santa Barbara County Homeless and Housing Issue Meeting with the electeds hosted by the county in Buellton and that same evening also attended the county's community meeting in Lompoc on the same issue and I want to thank the public that did show up for that. It was an important discussion and I really appreciate that. I have two council requests. One is with regards to the potential that PG&E will continue to shut off our electricity for the foreseeable future, and we need to do a better job of planning for the fact that we have our own electric electrical production. I'd like for the electrical um, director to look into potential battery storage and what that cost would look like and implementation so that we could collect our own production and when PG&E goes to turn our power off we not be without power because we have battery storage. And I would look for two to support me on looking into the costs of that. You got it. Could we combine that with the installation of generators? If a January 15th request was. Sure, I, I think it's a good discussion to have, yeah. I'll support. Okay. Ms. Cordova? I agree. Thank you. And then my second request is regarding the ADU program. When I was at League of California Cities, I sat in on a couple of different sessions, but I went by a booth that was actually one of what's considered the Helen Putnam Award that's given out by fellow cities. We look at and judge and vote on proposed um, programs that have been implemented. And the city of Encinitas, put a program together and won the Helen Putnam Award for a permit-ready ADU program. And it is available on their website, and I would like um, to direct staff to contact the city of Encinitas and look at their predisposed plans that they already committed to, approved, and w are happy to share. There's four different designs. There's a studio, a one-bedroom, one-bath, a two-bedroom, two-bath, and a three-bedroom, three-bath. And the designs are already presented and approved by their planning commission and planning department and have no fees associated with them because it's not a workload created by the planning staff. So I would like to ask council to support asking our planning department to reach out to Encinitas, explore this potential and bring it back because this would make it easier and streamline the process of putting ADUs in our, in our um, community. Thank you. I'll third. Thank you. Any clarification on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no other comments, so we'll adjourn this meeting to the next regular meeting at 6.30 p.m. on November 19th, 2019.